Unitex drastic measures to reduce spending. MDIL clamps down on fraudulent claims and veteran journalists published book on Bougainville crisis. This is National MTV News with Lorraine Genia. Good evening and thanks for joining us. This is Wednesday's news. The University of Technology says it is using the economically difficult period to rehabilitate its financial status through a gradual reduction in costs and an improvement in services and internally generated revenue. Over five years, the university will be reducing the large number of unattached and long-serving staff members. The need for cuts have become more pronounced with the economic downturn. The University of Technology has 200 faculty members, 400 support staff and 250 casuals, many of whom have worked with the university for decades. We should have between maybe 200, 400 support staff and we have 950. Now with the financial crisis triggered by the global downturn, the university will be looking to adjust. We are utilising this uh, financial crisis to, to uh, take a series of measures that should have been taken 20 years ago. While the government is expecting cuts from all agencies of state, it has requested universities to come up with plans to reduce costs. Unitech was already implementing a multi-pronged strategy, cost reduction, academic improvement and internal revenue generation. For this year, we have two and a half million less than we had last year in our operational budget. But to be fair, we have an increase in our infrastructure budget. So um, we will be hopefully able to uh, deal with a lot of the you know, maintenance that has been uh, postponed or not done in the past. The administration has reiterated that academic programs and infrastructure won't see a reduction. In fact, what can be expected are steady improvements, which of course require some expenditure. We have a quality assessment team which uh, controls all the subject uh, files. Uh, so subject files contain the full documentation for all the courses, the exams, the, the assessment methods, the lesson plans, um, uh, everything. And those uh, subject files will be tested once a year by an external assessor. On another front, reductions in cost have hit students over 300. 10% of the student population who received assistance through the government HECAS program didn't get theirs this year. Where the communication with the students is very, very important and that they know that uh, this is a situation that UNITEC did not create. Right? It's a situation beyond all of us and, it's, and I think they understand that. And so uh, on our part we are doing what we have to do. Others who have had their fees paid for by respective provincial governments are still waiting for the funding to come through. And most of the students, in the final year, they are very crucial time. We all, all, all have to start our class. Uh, at least this like seventy-five percent them can be paid by the government. The fifteen percent all can pay me. All going say them, please, me just like make one plan. Tomorrow, the students will hold a forum to discuss the loss of government assistance. The university administration has been in constant communication with the Ministry for Higher Education and while the responses have been positive, the funds are yet to arrive. Scott Whitey, National MTV News, Lay. Those who are thinking of lodging a false claim to Motor Vehicle Insurance Limited for third party insurance must be careful. This is the message from MVIL Chief Executive Officer Joe Wemmin. MVIL has now partnered with police and Port Moresby General Hospital to address fraud claims. MVIL have been experiencing a steady increase in the lodging of claims since 2005. The statistic shows that between 2005 and 2015, there were over 8,000 accidents that were reported in PNG. Over 29,000 claims have been lodged, which has cost MBIL over 180 million kina. We have realized that there is consistency in the way we are receiving claims from around the country. And that gave us a bit of, you know, suspicious and we are <coughs> suspicious of certain things happening in the society. 
CEO Joe Wemin says certain people in authorities like MVIL, police and hospitals are involved in aiding fraud claims. He said this partnership will help to decrease the level of false claims. Wemin said the traffic and hospitals, especially the accident and emergency doctors, are people who are directly involved in the process of claiming insurance. They don't report to the hospital. And that's where they should be reporting, like we got most of the hospital. But they tend to go to the urban clinics and uh, St. John's Garu to get the initial reports. And uh, when they come to the accident emergency, that's when we have the final medical report for processing with the MBI. Police and medical reports are evidence to claim insurance. However, from record, most claims do not come from a certified medical practitioner or traffic officer. So as a Papua New Guinean and as director of traffic, we will not condone this type of uh, behavior. According to MVIL's investigation into 135 claims in Central Province in 2015, 60 claims were confirmed to be potential fraud. So it is time now that you and I should put, put our hands together and identify and prosecute. Wemin also said claims in the Highlands region are increasing and are also difficult to investigate. Vasenata Yama, National MTV News. The two policemen allegedly involved in the death of a man in Port Moresby appeared for mention at the Waigani National Court this morning. Stanley Killip and Jack Aaron, both attached to the Gordons Police Station, were charged one count each for willful murder. Tekla Gunga reports. Two police officers were arrested last Sunday and were at the Boroko Police Station holding cells until this morning. The committal court heard that around 4 a.m. last Sunday, a fight broke out between members of the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary outside Sports Inn here at Gordons. It was alleged that Kilip grabbed the deceased Robert Giwa and punched him numerous times on his face. The second officer, Jack Aaron, was alleged to kick him numerous times before departing in a cab with other police officers. The deceased was taken to the Port Mosby General Hospital but was pronounced dead on arrival. Senior Magistrate Cosmos Bidar explained the charges to the two officers, stating that because of the seriousness of the case, bail will be granted at the National Court. Their case has been adjourned to March 10, awaiting police investigations. Both are now remanded at the Bomana Jail, however, can apply for bail anytime. Thekla Gunga, National, MTV News. A man was charged for one count of posting obscene language on social media by the, by the Waigani Committal Court under Section 266 of the Communication Act. Brendan Kadir was alleged to have commented on a Facebook post using obscene language against Medang MP Nixon Duban. Kadiu appeared for mention this morning before senior magistrate Cosmos Bidar. The committal court heard that the accused made a comment on Facebook discriminating the Medang MP. It was heard that the incident occurred on January 23rd this year and Kadiu is out on 300 kina bail. He was advised that police investigations are continuing and his case adjourned to March 10. In other matters, a woman appeared for mention on one count of stealing. Facility Paru was accused to have stolen money from her employer. And Shevastin Mai, a man from Kerama who was initially charged for sexual assault last year, had his case adjourned for the second time today. His case was struck out by the committal courts last month, but he was rearrested following new evidence. Today's adjournment was because his files were not signed by police investigators. Tekla Gunga, National, MTV News. Police have released details of robbery on Monday at Nadzab Airport in Ley. Five armed men held up the principal of Wasu Secondary School, Philip Lupan, at Nadzab and stole 150,000 Kina project fee money. Police say the principal flew in from Wasu. 
He was escorted by one police officer who was armed with a firearm. But the suspects held up the policeman and, and the principal and took off with the money and the police firearm. The suspects used a white Nissan sedan to escape. They drove to Tanam, some kilometres away from Leh, where, where they left the vehicle and fled on foot. Police pursued the suspects but were not able to stop them. The vehicle was seen at the Nadzab airport since last week. It's believed the robbery was well planned. Police identified the driver and the suspects who held up the principal as known criminals. They're now investigating. And still to come on National MTV News, PNG's first environmental refugees surviving on the atolls of Bougainville and behind the blockade, a book published about the events on Bougainville during the crisis. Those stories and more when we come back. Welcome back to the news. PNG's first environmental refugees would rather not be labelled as victims, instead wishing to be known as survivors. Hailing from the Carteret Islands in the autonomous region of Bougainville, the people there are working with the International Organisation for Migration to minimise the effects of climate change. They launched the Carteret Community Resilience Building Project and MTV's Nick Turner went along to witness the occasion. Member for Atolls within the ABG, Raymond Masono, says that the project has his full support. We in the Cutlet and in the Atolls are already facing the effects of climate change. The effect of climate change is an everyday issue for us. But we don't want to be pitied. We play not like him also government. IOM and NGOs, long sorry, long mipla, no God. We don't want pity. We, we don't want to be felt sorry about mipla like him support. We need support. Now, one time this is a support from IOM, at least, mipla by start implementing some something where countless organizations come from place from mipla, numerous documentaries about the way we are suffering, and yet time only finished. No one ever came back to tell us when I'm something now by come up. Over 150,000 kina worth of materials have been provided across the five islands for the various socio-economic groups and communities to use and implement the projects which they have chosen to pursue. Water tanks, a new banana boat, building materials, sewing machines and approximately 200 bags of cement were a part of the haul. And the islanders are excited to get started on a whole range of projects and initiatives. Manager for Adaptation with the Climate Change Development Authority, Emma Jill Bagaria High, says the approach being taken by the IOM in handing responsibility solely to those of the Carteret is an exciting strategy program looking at building climate uh, resilience to climate change in Papua New Guinea, uh, specifically in five island and atoll, five provinces and across 21 island and atoll communities. Cartreds is one of those uh, atoll communities that has already been identified and the work that's been carried out here by IOM will be most likely the model used to continue the work across the rest of Papua New Guinea. On face value, the Carteret Islands are a piece of paradise with their tranquil blue waters, pristine white beaches and not a tourist in sight. But spend just five minutes on the island and you'll see that climate change is a real issue for the people of the Carterets. However, there is hope and with this project being implemented by the IOM and their development partners, they hope to see the people of the Carterets empowered and the major player in the transformative process in regards to combating climate change. In Booker, for MTV National News, this is Nick Turner. A village in the Medang district is set to relocate their primary school after rising sea levels is threatening their community. Malmal Village last week received over 300,000 Kinan funding to relocate the Malmal Primary School to higher grounds. The impending threat of rising sea levels is affecting the village of Malmal, not of Medang town. It is shown here that what used to be land has now been covered by water. 
With the rise in sea levels, the people of Malmal are planning to take actions into their own hands, relocate to higher grounds. The Malmal Primary School will be the first major relocation project. However, the cost on the other hand has not made that possible. The school has also unfinished buildings, which adds extra costs to the relocation project. For all get a struggle, bro. this is a community, come, be, come, be, come. We are waiting for some law funding, hate, law government, but nothing happened. Last week, Medeng MP Nixon Duban was in Malmal to assist in the relocation and presented funds of 300,000 kina. Duban says the primary school is there to educate the children of Malmal and they must be aware of what is happening around them, especially on climate change and its effects. You are facing a very difficult situation. Good people from Malmal. Malmal. The sea level rise and the global warming issue are your immediate enemy in this part of the country. Immediate enemy. One more time, let's not press my face. Why? That is the reason why you are relocating the school, huh? Abstract. You are telling yourself the danger already. While the national government has made known its intentions to combat climate change, more is yet to be done on the issue. However, for communities like Malmal, early awareness and response can go a long way in combating climate change. The relocation of the primary school is set to be complete by the end of the year. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. Much has been written about the Bougainville crisis, but little from a Bougainvillian who lived through it. A veteran journalist is adding to that small pile of literature by sharing her experience in a book that was recently published. As a survivor and someone who covered the crisis during her long career, Veronica Hatutasi, a first-time published author, offers her book, Behind the Blockade, as an important historical literature on Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, and Pacific history. I felt that there was a need for the story to be told. You know, what people heard is something on the surface, huh? but they didn't really, you know, they don't really know how it was like for, you know, especially for the, the people who, you know, caught in the, um, in the crisis, especially, you know, innocent people like mothers, children, the elderly, and, you know, the peace-loving, those people who are not, you know, not um, involved, like involved, I mean, who didn't take up arms. Behind the blockade begins in 1989 when the blockade was placed on Bougainville. And for Veronica, it was when she was living with her young family in Toniva near Kieta. It follows her return home to CY and an event she describes as the CY sub-crisis. Three, three whole villages were, you know, they were taken as hostages by the PRA, some from our place and some from, from uh, central Bougainville. All... The book is published by her employer, Word Publishing, an employer she has been with for over 20 years as a journalist with their various papers. Another significant partner was the Divine Word Missionaries, or SVD. She is grateful that these partnerships have enabled the real experiences of Bougainvillians to be told. You know, just the struggles and hardships that, you know, people went through. And the longing for peace. While the book is already on sale for 66 kina, the official launching will be on the 26th of this month here in Port Moresby. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. And there are only 1,840 copies of Behind the Blockade out now. It took three years for Veronica to finish her book, which she wrote while working full time. While she is relieved that her book is finally published, she said there are many authors in the country who are struggling. One of the biggest challenges is uh, um, funding, uh, funding and finding sponsors. If you know the funding is not there, we have to find uh, sponsors to uh, sponsor the project. And 
you know, printing and publishing is not an easy task. It's, it's quite expensive. Papua New Guineans diagnosed with dental illness will now have access to modern dental treatment facility. This service is provided by two enthusiastic national female dental experts. Two female Papua New Guineans, Evelyn Mano and Ellen Campbell, are dental professionals in this field currently conducting medical checkups and surgery using state-of-the-art facility. We are doing the basic services at the moment with extractions, fillings, um, cleaning um, of the teeth, like um, polishing and all that. Um, we may soon start doing um, uh, whitening. Um, there are a few things that are missing still, so um, just the basics we're doing at the moment, but soon we will expand and do more than what we're doing at the moment. They have attained practicing certificates in dental surgery and old bachelor degree in medicine from the University of Papua New Guinea and have been practicing this service for some time. Since the beginning, this nationally owned dentistry company has been the foe of delivering this vital health service to the people. We would like to promote the idea of preventing uh, as, as well as treating dental diseases. This unit is composed of set-up chairs, infraoral light to cure affected tooth, suction kit and photo activator light to speed up whitening process and a sterilizing room to clean instruments prior to surgery. Meanwhile, they are receiving training from expert software trainer Alan Lim from the Company of Software of Excellence in Australia. Um, I'm here this week to train the practice in how to use a practice management software called Exact. Um, what Exact is, is that it helps a practice manage um, the patient database. It facilitates the accounting, the appointment book, and also the clinical side of things. To date, 50 dental patients have undergone treatment at Dental on Coronation in Dental Clinic in Port Mosby. It is situated at the Andy Group building at Boroko, Indonesia's capital. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. And to an earlier story, Governor of the Bank of PNG, Lloyd Bakani, says the PNG economy will continue to face difficulties due to the downturn and low export revenue. Slow growth in key global economies that triggered low prices continue to affect revenue inflows. The slow growth in the economy is expected to continue throughout this year. The state of the economy has forced the national government to adjust this year's budget. This is to try and stay within the budget and not to overspend. Due to the lower revenue the government is getting from the exports, the decline is expected to continue throughout this year. The drop has also put a lot of pressure on the country's foreign exchange. Business operations in the city will also be affected. They will be having difficulty in importing goods and as a result will be forced to scale down its operations. Business houses will have to make adjustments in order to reduce the amount of things they will sell. The companies here in Lei um, uh, face the difficulty of not being able to import what they are supposed to do, you know, what they are supposed to sell and all that, or for their, what they need for their production. Then they will have to scale down. So this is how overall, all, not only in Lei, but the whole of Papua New Guinea. While the decline is affecting the country, demand for banking services is increasing. Today, Westpac Bank opened its new branch at the market area. The new bank will allow both the retail and commercial customers to do their business. I think it's quite a, uh, a great thing for Lay City and also for our wider network of adding an additional branch and a modern branch that allows for both retail customers and commercial customers to do But the decline will also affect the bank's lending services. People will ask for less loans and the banks will be making less revenue. Meanwhile, employment rates in the Highlands, NGI and Southern regions have declined. But in Morobe and in the Mumase, it has increased, according to the Central Bank's September quarterly report. But then again, Morobe is also suffering a decline in the mining sector employment. The mining industry is cutting down on its employment. Mata Lewis, National MTV News, Lei. 
And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.3220 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3220 US dollars, 0.4517 Australian dollars, 0.2820 Euro and 36.79 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, coffee and cocoa closed higher, while gold and copper also closed the day higher. Palm oil and copper closed lower, while crude oil closed the day higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 13 points higher, the ASX closed at 122 points higher, and the All Ordinaries closed at 115 points higher. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Our Governor Gary Jufa, a strong supporter of the Free West Papua campaign, has applauded the government's move to allow West Papuan refugees to receive citizenship. The government will also waiver the requirements for citizenship, including a 10,000 kina fee. All these transpired following the PNG government's deal with Australia on the Manus asylum seekers. Governor Jufa said he was happy to see the government finally give recognition to the, to the refugees from West Papua. Gary Jufa has applauded the government and said that this was something that is long overdue for West Papuan refugees. This comes after a public outcry on the asylum agreement with Australia. Some West Papuans who sought refugees before independence can now be able to receive citizenship. Uh, deserves credit for what they've been doing insofar as the West Papua issue is concerned. For the first time we've had a Prime Minister who's come up and who's come out and spoken publicly about it and, and uh, raised concern about those atrocities. He has now given citizenship to West Papuan refugees that are living here. Jufa says that this was something personal to him because of the fact that his great-grandfather helped bring in the first 200 West Papuan refugees across by boat in 1969. They were brought across on a boat, the MV Crocodilo. That boat was captained by my father and it was owned by my grandfather. And they brought the first 200 refugees in 1969 into PNG. And as a result, I've always been involved I feel that the people of West Papua are my people too. In fact, they're all our people. They're Melanesians, just like us. That is one island. We have a responsibility to them, to speak up for them at all times. He also added that the fact that media in Papua New Guinea is not reporting on the deaths and horrific crimes that are occurring in West Papua is unbelievable, since other media around the world report on these issues. Then last month, there were murders there. There were shootings, there were killings. No one reports it in PNG. Why is that? All that information is available on the internet. You've got videos, you've got footage, you've got reports coming out in other parts of the world, but nothing from PNG. That is so strange. West Papua came under the control of Indonesia after the United Nations gave temporary authority on the 1st of May in 1963. Since then, the people have been fighting for independence. Their fight has caused the deaths of millions at the hands of Indonesia. Adelaide Sirox Kari, National MTV News. The Japanese ambassador to PNG, Mario Matsumoto, was in Lei yesterday to inspect projects that involved the Japanese government. His Excellency visited the Makam Bridge that was rehabilitated with Japanese aid in 2011. It was destroyed by floods in 2004. In 2005, the Japanese government, through grants, conducted studies and found faults in the bridge's four pillars. By 2011, the bridge was rehabilitated from a 40 million kina Japanese special grant aid. Matsumoto also inspected the Bukawa Road, a pilot site. The road is being built from machinery and technical support paid for by Japanese aid. He also met with the Lei Nadzab urbanization development team for a brief on the project. And today His Excellency visited the PPL office and the Sir Power Station at Taraka. Japanese experts in urban development, social welfare, finance and engineering are working to create proper plans to expand Lei City by 2015. 
Not having enough food, proper water and sanitation contributes to poor health. That's what Manam Islanders at the care centres in Medang are faced with. Health officers stationed at the care centres too have no choice but to deal with the cases day in, day out. Rachel Shise reports from Medang. For 12 years, Manam Islanders have lived in the care centres. Now with the ever-increasing population and faced with the challenge of poor sanitation, limited water, the general state of hill amongst the islanders has deteriorated. It is a slow death of a community displaced by the volcano more than 10 years ago. Lapun man na meri o sampla ino lapun, but just because of malaria, the situation where conditions mula stop long and inside of canvas, na mi play yu voklo strip lo ground, Call and walk him, na build up long time old malaria, na cause strong plaque cause pneumonia. He kill him that old man Mary one time old plant here long mama he carry him picking any baby yet. That is causing a mental stress on the health workers stationed at the care centres who are ill-equipped and out of stock all year round. Misa pain him hard yeah. Misa walk about lo pain him marasin. Me by go ask him no close this la health centre. At the health centers, the state of the buildings tell the story. It needs government help. Its staff are demoralized. There were more health workers, but there is only one at the health centers today. Me work and need lo government and me staff. Government must look save lo mina. At least, o se ma true lo registration number lo clinic lo mina ma sali marasin kamwe. Ba mix him direct lo government and me ba use him the same more people na me oklo staff one time more. Though it's tough, Doreen says she will continue to serve at the care center in the event of an eruption. This health center will be again on the front line receiving patients. If there was an eruption tomorrow, the workers here would not be able to handle the load. When I'm something, me feeling pain, all feeling pain, me too feeling one time all, and me have to stop, yeah. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. The Manam Islanders have been deprived of basic necessities for over 10 years, and their only hope now is their human resource. That means their children must be educated in the hope of sustaining their livelihood in the future, a future they hope will one day shift away from the care centres. The Manam Islanders are confronted with significant challenges. With limited land to find building materials to plant food with poor sanitation, their only hope now is in the future of their children. The leaders are looking to build a strong human resource base, a new generation that is not reliant on the land. But with last year's eight months drought, schooling for the children, food shortages prevented that much needed education from happening. All beginning, we plan repeating more. Since we plan to get kai kai yet, we plan to sell more go back lo belo. Not being able to plant enough and being unable to produce a surplus to sell means. Their means of sustaining a future is being challenged by circumstances. For many of the children, they won't make it to higher education. We got all big plopping in stuff, all go to school, all go to college, hard look by any man, all come back, stop nothing, no place. Now, all look, no blame me to block me, want a man, blow me. No, me to play, no buy school fee, blow all. Now, look, look, cry around, and stuff. In the care centers, there are more problems. The youth have turned to trading homebrew and marijuana for money. So only way I must buy marijuana, I must buy one of the list number, and I work on this house team. Salim, all roadside number, all man travel go come all by me, I buy my cake, and I buy my plus. So I look at this stuff. 
All this has caused more young people at the care centers to remain home with nothing to do. All give play extra problem. They involving drinking uh, ombro, uh, all walk go along or drugs. Now this is something that will create an extra problem. Instead of helping people, Papa and Mama. Richard Shise, National MTV News, Madang. Trukai Sports is up next. We'll have news on cricket and rugby league. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. Despite PNG's 2-1 series loss to Ireland in the T20, they managed to win the last match with a 11-run victory over Ireland. PNG had everything to play for after captain Jack Barra flew back to PNG following the untimely passing of his sister. Wearing black armbands as a tribute to the sister of Jack Vare, the bar's best start of the match was Asad Vala and Vani Morea who put on a 26-run opening partnership. Things quickly turned as PNG slipped to 3 out 428, but Sese Bao and Mahuru Dai dug in a 48-run partnership to bring PNG back into the contest. Charles Amini added the extras with a run of 24 to help PNG. The last three overs saw PNG blast off 226 to reach 8 out for 116. When Ireland came into bat, Charles Amini and Mahuru Dai kept them from finding the boundary. PNG bowlers put on an outstanding performance to see Ireland staring down a defeat at 9 out for 92. PNG all-rounder Amini said the win was a proud moment for the relatively inexperienced team and a fitting tribute for the captain. Elijah Levet, National MTV Sports. Fullback of the SBPNG Hunters, Stagrath Amien, has been one of the standouts for the team last season. On the eve of the 2016 season, apart from being a hunter, Amien also juggles responsibilities off field as a father. Meet Stagrath Amien an outspoken, humble 24-year-old who hails from Anger Province and is the fullback of the SP PNG Hunters. His passion for rugby league began at an early age. Uh, growing up, I was a little energetic uh, boy. So I used to, uh, during PE season, uh, I was the main one uh, playing. And yeah. during lunchtime, any chance I get, I used to play a lot. The sport was a yeah, big part of my life. And as the years went by, he became better and better. My name appeared on the Hunters uh, training squad, so it was a blessing for me. Uh, it was really hard, but uh, with the Lord's help, I made it through. So from well, what I am now, um, I take no glory, no pride, no honor in what I do, because I know my strength comes from the Lord, and uh, I know he can take it back anytime he wants to. So, yeah. From the Port Moresby Vipers to the Hunters, Stargroth has been an integral part of the team since last season. Yeah, since he came on board last year as a uh, fullback, he held on to that number one spot uh, all throughout the season. He played 25 games and, and then, uh, yeah, he's just uh, 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 one of the players that uh, probably, he, if you don't have it around fullback, I think he's just going to miss him. Uh, I've had clubs uh, from the other teams in the Q Cup. Uh, uh, competition also asking about him so how good he is under the eye ball and stuff like that but yeah no, he's a good, good kid yeah. Apart from his on-field success not many people know that Stargrath is new to parenthood having welcomed a son and juggling the responsibilities of a professional career in rugby league and a father Now that I am a parent uh, I'm enjoying every second of it and uh, my my favorite time with my son is uh, uh, changing his diaper and feeding him and like but I want to uh, wash him and like give him bath but he's too young and uh, but I'm trying to learn how to <laughs> do that to him so yeah. As the 2016 season of the Intra Super Cup is about to begin, Stargrath is excited for what the new season will bring and hopes to improve. His dream is to pull on the Kumuls jersey and represent his country one day. Uh, my biggest goal in rugby league is um, uh, repping my country one day, one fine day. 
Since his debut for the Hunters last season, the 24-year-old has grown with confidence and is ready for what his future in rugby league has in store for him. Dion Kombeng, National MTV Sports. And Trukai Sports continues after the break. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. While the Auckland Nines was a great way to start the season, Penrith's match against the Papua New Guinea Hunters was just as important for the game of rugby league. It was an experience to embrace for, young, for the young Penrith side that took on the Hunters at the newly opened National Football Stadium in Port Moresby. For Penrith, it was a great opportunity for the young players, led by Jamie Sowell, to get a hit before the season starts. It was good for rugby league mad community to see their side take on an NRL team, an acknowledgement made by Panthers' official site that reads, We keep talking about expansion of our game without really conducting any market research. While it will be a long time before Papua New Guinea compete in the National League, taking a game there to gauge support and sentiment is a good step. The Prime Minister's Tetin is another game that takes place in Papua New Guinea each year. It further stated that such games is what rugby league should be about, giving a quality product to the people who want it and appreciate it most. The Panthers did a lap of the crowd afterwards, and there were joy and appreciation on the faces of people who got photos with the players, most of whom are yet to play in the NRL. While the Nines replicated these teams over the weekend, the game in Papua New Guinea was just that little bit more special. There was no controversy, no star players, no beef, just a game played for the enjoyment of the players and the crowd. It was simple but positive. If the Panthers continue to take games to Papua New Guinea and that first great games are played here in the future, it will only be satisfactory that the country have shown just as much as New Zealand has with the Nines. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. In football, the NSL board has yet to receive the official match report regarding an incident of spectator violence in the Round 10 match between Lay City Dwellers and Medang FC. Competition coordinator Simon Koima made this known at yesterday's press conference when queried on the outcome. The NSL has yet to confirm what type of action will be taken and against whom until the report is reviewed and evidence collected. And I have a referee assessor, and I have a referee, and two assistants. Um, I was notified of the incident in Medellin on Saturday. And immediately I contacted this head of Northern Conference to say I wanted to report by Sunday. As of today, I haven't got the report. And I believe that you can help me with it. I don't got the report from them, you will help me out. And that ends Trukai Sports. Your weather details after the break. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. And now looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. Cloudy with a chance of showers and possible thunderstorms in Port Moresby. Cloudy with a chance of showers developing in Daru and Kerama. Some showers and possible thunderstorms in Alutau and some showers for Popondeta. In the Momase region, showers forming for Lay City. Cloudy with a chance of rain and showers for Medang and Wewak. And some showers and possible thunderstorms in Bunimore. In the New Guinea Islands, some showers for Loringa and Kaviang, a shower or two for Kokopo, Rabao and Kimbe, and cloudy with the possibility of showers developing later on for Buka. And lastly in the Highlands region, cloudy with evening rain for all centres. And now recapping our main stories for tonight. Unitex drastic measures to reduce spending, MBIL clamps down on fraudulent claims, and veteran journalists publish book on Bougainville crisis. 
And that's the news, sports and weather for tonight, Wednesday, the 10th of February 2016. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Lorraine Genia. Pleasant viewing. Good night.